and we're live. Hello, everybody. Hello, Lisa. Hey, Josh. Hey, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good Wednesday. Yes. Um, quick introduction. This is Sky. Is hey, Sky. <laughs> in, in case anybody wonders, he is a he is a full blood uh, basset hound puppy. He is nine weeks old. He is my puppy, and uh, sweet. He's uh, he is named uh, for the Isle of Skye in the Hebrides, and and also because I wanted a one syllable name because I have a long yes I do I will have a long history of name. <laughs> Yes, uh, a long history of naming dogs and, and all kinds of animals, multi-word, multi-syllable, there we go, multi-syllable names that are impossible for anyone, including the animal, to remember. So I thought I would break with type and go with something simple. <laughs> well, we are glad to have him as a mascot. Yes, uh, yes, we are, and uh, and who knows? He may uh, he may learn to enjoy um, paranormal research and actually going on investigations soon. Oh, I imagine he might. <laughs> um, in terms of haunted locations, we also have a a haunted location that is a bookstore that is worth mentioning. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, we find books in Joplin. Yes. Was, oh, yes. Was there, I'm a little jealous. You've been there before. I more recently than I have, but uh, yeah. 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 We do have fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will have to I'll I will share and let you drill later. Oh fantastic. And uh and same. I know I have a couple of, of uh titles that uh that you're looking forward to reading as soon as I get done with them as well. So yes. It's uh, it's all part of the fun. Uh where can folks find out more about always buying books? Well, if you're going through the Joplin area, they are at uh, 5357 North Main Street. Uh if you're not coming through locally, then find them on Facebook at Always Buying Books. There's also a public group associated with the store, friends who like Always Buying Books. Um, nice thing about that is inventory is listed and you can call and order it and they will mail it to you. You can also go to their website, alwaysbuyingbooks.net and again, uh, order through there. Um, yes. Or if you're looking for something, call them up and see if they've got it or if they can hook you up with it. Absolutely, and that and uh, Bob and Elise do an, an amazing job of curating their selections and their collections, both, and, uh, and are incredible folks to work with. Particularly if you're just if you're looking for something, you know, certain genres or, or unique things within certain genres, it's a place to go. And really I, I uh, am finding myself uh, very rapidly relying upon um, Bob's innate. Uh, talents in terms of, of curating, because in all honesty, I like his curation a lot better than algorithms that I usually rely upon. Yeah. Um, well, there, there's there's something to have been doing it for longer than a lot of people have been alive. And, <laughs> and um, they, they just do a really good job and you never know what's coming in. And uh, so it's one of those things that, you know, check back often because you will be surprised. And yeah. we are very pleased to uh, have them as a sponsor and, you know, check them out and tell them that Josh and Lisa sent you. So. Absolutely. And of course, coming up in October, uh, make plans to join us in Joplin in conjunction with Always Buying Books. Tell us what we got coming up. Well, um, October Country is going to be a one a full day event um, covering everything in the Dark Ozarks milieu from uh, paranormal mysteries to dark history to everything in between. And uh, it's going to be at the VFW Post uh, 534, also on Main Street in Joplin. Uh, nice thing is there will be, you know, they have a restaurant, they have a bar that will be open. And so people can uh snack and and have a drink and enjoy the fair and so uh it'll be fun it's gonna be a lot of fun and uh 
I, I think this, for, for me anyway, this will be pretty much my quintessential Halloween event. We, uh, you know, and I, I, would, I would throw this out and just, just challenge people. I mean, Halloween parties are a lot of fun. And heaven knows that I love to dress up. Um, I love it so much. I just embrace cosplay and dress up as a variety of things, regardless of what time of year it is. But there is something rather superficial in terms of the quintessential Halloween party. And if, uh, you know, the paranormal or the, the noir is of interest to you, an event like this, I, I think certainly for myself, this event, upcoming event is a much more satisfying way to really uh, center the, the Halloween season because it's, it is more than just essentially grotesquery or just cheap thrills, essentially. No, and we and and the audience is a part of it. Mm -hmm. We we get we get people involved. We're not just talking heads. Uh, the, the panelists we have are very knowledgeable, and uh, but we want to hear from you too. And and it's a dialogue, and that's what we enjoy. It is. It is an enormous amount of fun. <clears throat> and again, we we have the opportunity to hear uh, stories from you all that uh, are that. And th this is certainly something that I think we're going to be talking about very rapidly as we jump into our topic tonight. But individuals who uh, live in the, you know, are embedded within the region, <clears throat> while the individual who has, for example, had an experience or has a family history, uh, you know, to, to, that has been passed down, et cetera, that person might be very easily overlooked by quite frankly a lot of people um because it's not an a recognized voice right and, and at the same time by the same token it's very important to to take into account that these are individuals whose stories are not only very personally important to them these are stories that are important uh they they have validity they might not have been Mm, you know, recorded by an, in, a, in an officially historical way, but the the ideas, the feelings, the thoughts, the emotions, everything that comes together to to make up the the fact that this was important enough to pass down, or as as a personal paranormal experience, certainly important enough to leave a, a memory. This is very important. Your voices, you, the the public who are embedded within the Ozarks who have these historical or these paranormal experiences, or in some cases both, um, your voices are incredibly important. And we are always grateful to hear from you, whether uh, via social media or email uh, or phone, or in the case of events like October Country, because you share. Exactly, and, and, we, and we love that. And I guess we'll just throw out a little teaser that you know, we've got other things that are gonna be coming up soon too, including um, the Southeast, uh, Kansas border town uh, Paracon will be there uh, September 24th um, yes. and then also an event first uh, weekend in October in Hollister yes yes um, <clears throat> be doing uh, uh, really just it, it will I believe in conjunction with our, our first Friday art walk um, we'll be working up a, a historical uh, tour and uh, uh, of downtown Hollister, lots and lots of, of neat things there, and uh, and uh, you know a ghost tour as well. Well, they might get they might catch us in period clothing too. So <laughs> they just might. <laughs> uh, quite quite possible. Quite uh, <laughs> speaking of cosplay, what is so funny for me? I know we've discussed this, but uh, I guess I, we haven't uh, talked about it in depth. Um, of course, we uh, were at the, we we're at the, I may have to calm down a puppy here in a moment. Um, we had, uh, we're at the Battle of Carthage, uh, recently published an article on the reenactment of the Battle of Carthage, an incredible time. Uh, I'll let you take it from here. Um, 
for just a moment. Well, I'll finish my thought. Mm -hmm. I'll let you just share some things. <laughs> you want me to finish your thought? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, while we were at the reenactment, as Josh said, he's he he, he does cosplay quite a bit, but he uh, I think he's got a new affinity for uh, reenactment clothing now. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it was such an odd thing. I always enjoy cosplay, but it was, oh, yeah, the, the reenactment Saturday, it was uh, 80 some degrees the day before, and it was about 50. Uh, the <laughs> certainly felt like 40 uh, mm -hmm. with uh, a stiff breeze and quite a bit of rain. And I realized that I was going to freeze to death and turn into a little Josh sickle. And um, so outfitted myself rather expediently in all period clothing. What was so surprising to me was how exceptionally natural it felt. It did not feel like I was wearing, quote unquote, a costume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and you can tell that. So you know, so <laughs> one little thing that may be coming up and there'll be other announcements coming too for other things. So yes, now, our, our topic is pro problematic events um, and I guess in quotes and people in the Civil War in the Ozarks. Um, <laughs> um, and I think most people think of this when they hear something like this and they think of you know, what do we do with, you know, Confederate statues and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And um, characters that uh, stood for things that today we would say, how in the world we, we couldn't do that. Yes. Um, and while that's true, you know, there, is, there are those issues, it, it wasn't just one sided. And I think that's one thing that particularly, <laughs> I'm sorry, it seemed to demonstrate. <laughs> <I'm> sorry, <laughs> tickled at him. Um, that um, there were problematic issues on both sides, um, and um, and I think you mentioned over on YouTube that in in some respects, in ways that really didn't happen too much in the Eastern theater, um, except for when we get to Sherman's March to the Sea, which of at that point, it was a conscious decision to basically shut down any any ability to uh, fight back. Um, and while Sherman is vilified um, for that, ironically, when he got his orders, he he expressed the fact that he knew he would be vilified in the end over this. Um, yes which does take us back around to the issue that um, ironically at the beginning of the war, um, the future General Sherman, becomes a Sherman, was standing in St. Louis watching um, Governor Jackson's uh, Missouri Guard being marched into, um, into town under federal troop, troop authority. Yes. And it, it's such an early point in the conflict. Yes, we're, we're, that was May of 1861. But again, you know, it's we, so often we get told, oh, this person or that person, they have no connection to the, to the Ozarks and that we bring up. And it, it's just one of those examples. Most people think, well, Sherman had no connection to the Ozarks, but in May 1861, that's exactly where he was. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. it it really speaks to the fact that especially Missouri and, and this is important to, to contextualize much, not all of what happened um, during during the war in Missouri and in Arkansas, that Missouri was recognized and, and I would say to, to some degree um, was probably recognized more by Lincoln as the as a linchpin to the war than mm -hmm. it was initially potentially recognized by by many of the decision makers of the Confederacy. 
Well, and I think so. And and I, and to be honest, that may be for coming from the fact that you know, being from Illinois, mm-hmm. he was very familiar with. I think the influences, you know, back and forth across the Mississippi, and was probably more aware of all of the resources and so forth in the area than they were in Richmond, you know. Right. <clears throat> and I think that that is is an interesting thing. It, it would be fun to do some some sort of point counterpoint research um, with the, the the sentiment or the the opinions of the strategic value of Missouri. I know there was obviously I think pretty much everybody recognized that there was some crucial value. Um, but it does it does bring up an interesting point. Lincoln was, you know, to, to such a large degree of, you know, came from a rural background that that was certainly a, from a region that was much more closely associated with Missouri than than he, uh, he was really a Western man. I mean, um, in the sense of what what that meant in that time period. So um yes. You know, it would be, um, to be perfectly honest, I mean, you were from Missouri and, and had never been east, you know, how, how familiar would be you be with all of the various areas along the Atlantic coast? I mean, it's the same thing. Um, it is. But, I, but I do think he, he had that uh, insight that um, made him aware that all efforts needed to be made to keep Missouri in in the Union, and and those those issues uh, really led to some extremely difficult decisions that also led to uh, atrocities within the yes. within the war. They, they, cer- they certainly did. Um, uh, where where do you want where do we want to start with all this? <laughs> ah, oh my god. I I would say I would say setting the stage. Uh it's probably important to begin with Osceola, the burning of I Osceola. Think, I think so. Um Osceola, Missouri. And we have talked about Osceola in in, in a lot more depth before. Yes. But on a on a much colder night than it is tonight. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, no, it feels like the the, the, the fires are being uh, the flames are being fanned today. Um, yes. But you know that was relatively early in the war, early 1862, and a lot of the prob- problematic characters in some of these events really one has a direct impact on the next one happening and Osceola was burned in 1862 in retaliation for uh, attacks on Humboldt, Kansas, which is just barely, barely outside the Ozarks. But um, so, which was Confederate uh, leaning. And so in retaliation, Jim Lane marched from Kansas to burn Osceola. Yes. And, and I think, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, I think uh, Jim Lane is a very, very interesting character, to say the least. Yes. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it might, obviously, there are the, every individual, whether they're considered heroes or villains, um, or heroes by some, villains by other, have a lot of, of nuance associated Mm -hmm. with them that's important to contextualize them as a person making difficult decisions um it is i find jim lane very interesting very intriguing uh, because it he could easily be characterized as uh, a staunch abolitionist willing to commit atrocity for profit Yes, yes. Um, and, and I think it's really kind of hard not to say that because just some just things in his own statements. 
but then you throw in that there there's a very you can all you can also say that there would not uh, Quantrell would not have been what William Quantrell is known as now if it weren't for Jim Lane yes. uh, and and they certainly are intertwined that's beyond the scope of tonight um, but Lane decided he was going to make a big statement. And so he decided to raid Osceola because it did, it, it did tend to be Southern leaning, but in his mind, I think it more importantly, it was prosperous, very prosperous. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that would surprise a lot of people today because mm -hmm. um, it is a very small town, about 900 people. Uh, but in 1862, it had what, about 4,000 people, and it was the largest commercial center in uh, southern Missouri. Yes, this would this would have been um, bigger than Springfield, uh, yeah. bigger bigger than. Um, I'd have to actually make a point of comparison. I haven't done it, but um, I would say you know as a commercial center you know, notable in comparison to at the time Jefferson City and uh, in St. Joe and, uh, you know, these these locations that that we we really recognize for their today for their commerce or their their uh, governmental hub, et cetera. And, and and also and I just find this incredibly intriguing, of course, the the uh, impoundments uh, of the of the Osage River. Uh, Etc. have have you know permanently changed this, but at the time uh, Osceola was uh, you know on a navigable waterway that was being ser serviced by steamboats from New Orleans. Yes, I mean it was a major river port. We don't you know that's the last thing we think about, particularly in the interior of Southern Missouri. But uh, yeah. it was and. They had a lot of money in town. They had a lot of money in their banks, and Jim Lane wanted it. To yes. be perfectly honest. I I find I find this interesting. I don't have proof of this, but it, it seems interesting in terms of just speaking into the 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 cultural milieu of that generation and then the generations following, um, because Harold Bell Wright in his seminal novel um, *Shepherd of the Hills*, published in 1907 which began the Branson tourism boom, created a character named Jim Lane, who I cannot help but think was, you know, the name being spawned by the idea that this is a, a name that was still being remembered in the hills. I would think so. Yeah. I mean, I would think uh, so. I mean, and, and, and Wright was, you know, he was, you know, time he was writing it and, and started going down the White River. I mean, he lived in Lebanon, which isn't, that far from Osceola. <laughs> no. And and I find it particularly interesting because the, the Jim Lane of Shepherd of the Hills is a Southern gentleman who is um a uh, you know a leader of a of a of a vigilante band and uh, and former Confederate. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't help but wonder if there wasn't just a little bit of uh which mm, obviously you're calling it good <laughs> yeah. that's it and, and the idea that if, if you know that, because uh, that's basically what jim lane was doing you know but mm -hmm. just for quote the union cause but in reality probably more for his cause than the union <laughs> yes i you know the the account uh with the burning of osceola that um uh, the the new church's um handmade oak pews and its piano and its i believe stained glass windows possibly were were carefully taken out loaded onto a wagon and uh and, and lane sends them back to his wife and his church in kansas before the building is burned uh it's time to do that but he was yeah. very disappointed that they had basically gotten heads up and all the money was in that, all the bank vaults were empty <laughs> Of course, right. that did lead him to then, you know, uh, end up executing a few people, unfortunately. Yes. 
and I think this is a, an interesting point counterpoint with the Bernie of Osceola. One, uh, there's only about 10 dead mm -hmm. um, and 10 killed. And so in the larger annals of history, um, as in even just the, the annals of civil war history in which you had, you know, um, Shiloh, Vicksburg, Gettysburg, thousands and thousands and thousands dead. And you do a point counterpoint of that with the burning of Osceola and you say, well, what was the casualty count? 10. It, it relegates it as a footnote in the war. The, the, and yet it wasn't. It was, it was a very significant early on uh, event that had a cascade effect in terms of how Southwest Missouri and it, it, it basically galvanized uh, pro-Confederate support mm -hmm. in the region and an anti-Federalist or anti-USA sentiment in the region in ways that then began to lead to high casualty counts and things like order number 11. Exactly. Well, and directly, you know, ultimately, um, you know, Osceola is catalyst for a year later for the sacking of Lawrence. Yes. When the sacking of Lawrence had rather far reaching impact in terms of not only the event itself, but just the idea. Right. And it is much more well remembered today. And something else that, that really comes to mind, I want to do more, more regional research with the, the, the Osceola area, because we're, we're mm -hmm. dealing with, with Osceola, it's near Humansville, et cetera. We're getting an increasing number. And if you all who are listening have, have a story that you'd like to share, please feel free. We'd love to hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, but increasing number of paranormal stories from that region yeah. uh, dealing with uh, incidences or activity that in some cases highly suggest uh, deaths that occurred during the Civil War, in some cases pretty directly, like irrefutably. Um, right. You know, a, a, a man in Civil War in a Union uh, uniform um, appearing in someone's bedroom on a yeah. semi-regular basis, these types of things. It's um, that <clears throat> this is even now, I think from a, from a historical perspective, an easy to overlook area. But we look at the burning of Osceola, we look at the situations that took place, and we realize that there obviously were a number of small recorded battles, but then an enormous amount of skirmishes and guerrilla warfare that resulted in quite likely for the, uh, the per capita population of the counties involved, the basically low population of the counties involved, a really high casualty rate that oh, definitely that that is has remained largely untold and in some cases there simply isn't documentation but i find it interesting and a, and a little poignant really actually quite poignant that a situation may occur may have occurred in which there is no recorded history of the casualties of men who who died wanting their death to mean something history does not record their death there are no markers there are no graves there are no no one left alive to remember that these men gave their life for something and yet individuals um will encounter them and sometimes tell us their story. Yeah. And and I and I'm honored when that happens. I, I really am. And I, I am too. Uh, but I, yeah. And and we've talked for a while about getting up getting up in that area. We want to do that more. So hopefully we'll be doing that before too long. Yes. But so Basically, then the elephant in the room is after Lawrence. Um, basically, something had to, something had to give, and then it was a matter of what what is the response. Um, 
and the union's response uh, initially from Thomas Ewing, he was the general in charge of the of Western Missouri. Um, he uh, sought approval for the, his order, General Order 11. And the way it often is is told and, and taught is that General Order 11 was to clear out um, Southern sympathizers out of Western Missouri and to require an oath of allegiance. But in actuality, that kind of came later. Uh, General Order Number 11 was more harsh. Uh, initially it it was we've got to do something and, and, and in part um this was he was trying to deal with not only con, uh, confederate guerrilla fighters in western missouri there was a large number of union guerrilla fighters fighting the other guerrillas as well as raiding into kansas and he's trying to protect the border to kansas as well and then he's now got Jim Lane, who burned Osceola the year before, uh, ranting and raving that he's not doing enough um, to get even with Quantrell over Lawrence. And so, and this is all within a matter of days. So four days after the burning of Lawrence, General Order 11 is issued, which basically orders all the rural areas in most of four counties, Jackson County, which now ha um, is where Kansas City is. Um, but at the time, Independence was the, the largest city and then Westport, um, Cass County, Bates County, and portions of Vernon County uh, going south. Um, and that basically everybody, it didn't matter which side you leaned towards, you, if you lived in a rural area, you had to move to town or within a mile of a federal army post. Um, and the idea being trying to uh, keep the guerrilla fighters from getting support from the farms. Um, and that kind of backfired actually, because as they cleared everyone out, they couldn't take everything. So gorillas were going through and, and taking supplies and livestock and everything that people had to leave. So, so it, it had the opposite effect initially. Uh, plus a lot of people, you know, played, you know, farms were burned, everything else. And, and as, as the orders are being executed, um, Lincoln had even told Ewing to make sure that this basically doesn't turn into martial law. Yeah. And basically what happened is you, you had troops going through and basically just killing people and even by a lot of accounts, even as they are complying with the orders, um, basically chaos ensues. Yes. Yes, and it does. And this did a lot to galvanize opinions after the war too. And with, with the um, idea um, and the view that the union was really the bad guy in Western Missouri. It, it did. I, I'm curious to, and your thoughts on this, something that I seem to have observed, seem to have observed um it was a couple of you know maybe one two three three uh dynamics happening uh, simultaneously post-war one the the generation who survived and then remained really harbored uh a, a deep-seated resentment in some cases deep-seated hate for mm -hmm. uh, essentially DC, Lincoln, mm -hmm. and and the administration and the federal army that had done this. Yeah, I, I think that that's very fair. And and ironically, this version of the war only lasted a few months, and then Ewing was moved out to another position, and he was replaced. And his replacement did not approve of this order, and so he entered another order that basically said it would only apply to Southern 
sympathizers that yes. union men could stay on their land and right. that even Southern sympathizers could stay on their land if they signed an oath of allegiance. Right. You know, one thing that did happen that doesn't get talked about a lot is because it's always talked about just the four counties being involved, but the army did march further south and 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 uh, uh, go through and try to clear out sympathizers and uh, clear down to the Arkansas border. Um, but that part that part doesn't get talked about a whole lot. And that that the you know certainly my my first introduction to order number 11 and uh, the the kind of resentment kind of really just even uh, again i think hatred is a is a is is an accurate word mm -hmm. um, but it generated actually came from uh, moral miller's uh, oral autobiography of harry s truman and because ironically Truman's mother uh, was, a, as a child, uh, a part of this uh, evacuation or, or removal. And yeah, that, I mean, that's not surprising. Well, I mean, you know, little Truman, Truman was born in Lamar, which is just south of Vernon <laughs> County. And so it doesn't surprise me in the least. And, you know, the, the uh, you know, fast forward to, Oh, the 1940s, and Truman is president, and we're we're really within the quote unquote modern era. And there's this this story in which he goes back to visit his mother, who was extremely ill and and elderly at this point. And I think for something like a day, she refuses to talk to him. Um, and finally, he you know presses the issue and said basically you know i came i'm president of the united states i came all the way back here to see you why are you not talking to me and she looks at him and says i saw you i, I saw the photos re referencing to the newspaper i saw the photos of you laying that wreath on lincoln's memorial <laughs> I had not heard that story. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that, you know, 80, 80 years later. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and not even thinking that, you know, uh, regardless of all of that, that, you know, as president or something, he has to do certain things. <laughs> <laughs> Your son is the president of the United States. Same position, uh -huh. Lincoln. <laughs> Exactly. I, uh, well, I've always been a huge fan of Truman. Um, same. At, uh, at the same time, many of those who were forced to leave uh, did not come back. Many did not. Some did, uh, particularly over time, but yeah. And I, I, a, 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 a cultural dynamic that I find really interesting, and I'm... Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to see if I can make anybody mad when I say this, but I have an incredibly cute puppy in my arms, so you know you can only stay mad at me for so long. Um, <clears throat> is that a lot of now uh, long-standing Ozarks families uh, who trace their lineage back a really long time and say we're the original families of the Ozarks. Mm -hmm. arrived after 1874 and were union families from Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio moving in on land that had belonged to, uh, to Confederate leaning or individuals, families recognized as Confederate leaning regardless of what their actual opinion were and had been forcibly removed mm -hmm. uh, in during this time. Yeah, that did happen. <laughs> So it's, you know, the, the, the issues of, uh, uh, of who came first is really, I think, irrelevant when you consider that, that the, the reality of, of human beings existing within a space and other human beings pushing them out of that space has been a violent tapestry going back over 10,000 years. Yes, I mean... 
unfortunately, a lot having to just do with human nature, whether we like that or not. Yeah, and I think that many of the stories, especially on the on the ground stories uh, for tonight, can show a really dark side of human nature that mm -hmm. is not partisan one way or the other. It's, you know, in some cases, individuals who committing atrocities who were, um, say, for example, pro uh, Missouri State Guard slash uh, partisan, um, pro Confederacy, and then you can easily s switch things around uh, to individuals like Jim Lane, who was essentially a staunch abolitionist for hire. And there's there's a lot and and that was something that uh you know was especially noted in mm, sort of mid-era comments made by joe shelby that one of the things that he hated about the the kansan abolitionists were that in his opinion they were using the cause of abolition to come in and take things from other people that they could not have afforded themselves well, and, and that's that, I mean, that's, that's true. And in Lane's, Lane's case, that certainly, I mean, not that he couldn't afford things, but he just wanted what everyone else had too, it seemed. <laughs> I, uh, we, we always get as, uh, you know, in the, the easy question of, you know, if, if, in, if you could have any conversation with anyone living or dead, who would it be? I think I'm going to add a wrinkle to that in terms of a new answer, which is, I don't want to have a conversation I want to observe a conversation between Jim Lane and Joe Shelby about 1862. <laughs> I, I dare say Jim Lane better better hide. <laughs> that would be my opinion. As, <laughs> as as he was historically recorded to have done during the raid on Lawrence. In, in, in a nightgown, as I recall, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Hiding in a cornfield in his pajamas when he didn't have the uh, uh, the rest of his army to back him up. That's right. <laughs> Which well, I, would, I would. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say I would. I would. Uh, well, not even. I don't even have to conjecture. Um, I, I guarantee you, uh, Shelby would not have done that. No, no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, 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 that, that would not have happened. So, but uh, your, your comment about, you know, uh, partisanism there, as far as it, it wasn't, you know, the, the partisan, partisan, partisanism wasn't always clear. Um, a good example with, you know, with General Order 11, you know, is um, uh, George Caleb Bingham, who, uh, was a union man and yes. opposed Ewing, um, um, issuing order 11. In fact, um, uh, tried to talk him out of it and told him that he would do everything he could to ruin him <laughs> with the pen and the brush. And, and he pretty well did uh, as far as uh, Ewing's um, uh, legacy and how he's remembered. Uh, with his painting and the execution of General Order 11. Yes, and, uh, it, it's, a, it's a poignant painting. Uh, it, well, it is, and it, and it, 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 shows, it shows women and old men, you know, uh, trying to be, you know, trying to submit to the authority of the army and being gunned down and, and the town being burned and so forth. And, um, it's 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 something that is very telling when you when you can examine it in detail and and I I have because there's one there's a there's a copy of it hanging in the Bates County Courthouse, um, and so I've I've stood and examined that many times, um, and um, although I I know uh, some people, um, well yeah Castile. Art, the art historian labeled it as mediocre art, but uh, that's the propaganda. And uh, I think maybe he was a little too harsh on the on his criticism. Criticism of the scene, but uh, it certainly worked as um, for the propaganda um, uh, purpose that uh, Bingham had. And 
Ewing is not fondly remembered. And, and, and I think Bingham's painting probably is the image most people think of with General Order 11. I, um, it, just as we're discussing this, that question came to mind, I want to get your opinion on, okay. really just in regards to uh, really just court and the judicial system during the this longer transition for sort of post-war transitional process obviously uh the the court system being reestablished after the war and, mm -hmm. and then continuing on what made me think of this was the fact that this painting hangs in the courthouse and <clears throat> that I, I think undeniably just in terms of, of general public perception the, uh, the the reestablishment of, of the court system is is irrevocably linked to the state and national government, which of course was the winners, uh, mm -hmm. the union. Mm -hmm. How how do you feel over the course of the generations within this space within Southwest Missouri? Uh, folks responded to that. I mean, do, would, do you think there was a lot of antipathy? Do you think it? How, what's your thoughts? Well, actually, I, th I think in, in most places, it seems like it was very much welcome because there was such a, a vacuum, when I say a power vacuum, there, there was no law enforcement, there, there was no court authority, um, chaos had reigned throughout the war in so many places with guerrilla warfare, etc., and just bushwhacking, you know, not mm -hmm. even uh, for one side or the other, but just criminal activity that I think that most people, regardless of their political sentiment, were relieved to have order um, as things got uh, going again. Um, and and it, most people don't think about it. There were a lot of counties that, I mean, literally no county business got done for four years. I mean, um, yeah. just nothing happened. And so, um, we, we, you know, people talk about how odd it is, you know, we've had it through the pandemic and things were, you know, shut down a little bit or this or that, or, or feeling like, you know, they're in limbo or whatever. Imagine absolutely nothing happening for four years. Um, yeah. Other, other than you know, worrying about whether or not your house is going to be burned down by one side or the other. Um, mm -hmm. So regardless of politics, I just think most people were relieved that, you know, there was some sense of order, uh, even if they didn't agree with everything. Yeah, and that makes sense. And, it, you know, it's <clears throat> something that I think happens under, under extreme duress. I think kind of two things happen under extreme duress with, uh, with humanity and the, these really difficult situations. Many, many people simply become very, very pragmatic, but also rise to the occasion in terms of, you know, meeting needs. And right. then a, uh, a percentage, fortunately, I think a comparatively small, but um, statistically memorable percentage, uh, essentially become incredibly vicious and, and, and to a large degree go feral. Well, yeah, and, and that, that definitely was the bushwhacking element. Yes. Um, and, and that happened during the war as well as after. Um, it did. And, and you know, that, that became a, a big issue. Um, do we want do we want to delve into Palmyra now? Absolutely. <laughs> Borderlands. Speaking <laughs> of Quad Myers. Um, and in some ways, Palmyra is remembered, at least in this part of the country, um, the massacre there. It was in fall of 1862. Um, and, but it, it, it was not an isolated type of event, but it, it, it illustrates a lot of kind of how things were going. Now, this is a little further north, um, and uh, Palmyra is, but basically, we'll, um, well, let's since we're we're, we're in long format, I we talked about this on YouTube, but I think it bears mentioning um, 
that there is Ozarks cultural yeah. proper. There's uh, which would would be regions that Ozark hillbilly culture mm-hmm. re- remains to this day. There is Ozarks uh, geological or topographical proper, which mm-hmm. has uh, definable, the very definable region. Um, the not always the same. Uh, I right. think that's important to understand. And then you have Ozarks borderlands, which based on uh, transit of, uh, of, of people, uh, the movement of culture, uh, trade route, trade roads, uh, you know, wagon roads, um, uh, railroads to a degree, uh, and, and especially river routes with the steamboats that you saw cross cultural, um, you know, pollination, but also just significantly historical events that, for example, might have, the event might have started within Ozarks proper, um, and then transitioned out of the Ozarks, uh, implicating or involving another chunk of, uh, of border, border territory, or vice versa, an event may have taken place uh, outside of the Ozarks, but its repercussions directly impacted uh, historical and significant events within the Ozarks. So there's a lot of interesting inroads and crossroads. And then there is also the reality of a, of a thick borderlands region surrounding the Ozarks mm-hmm. and uh, Kansas, Northern Missouri. Kansas, to me, Kansas, Northern Missouri, and the Arkansas River Valley really fall into these categories. I they they do, especially culturally, and in and like in this instance, even though it's in, in that northern more northern area, it it's this is um, pretty egregious, but it's certainly not isolated. And certainly, other events in the Ozarks happen like this. Um, yes. And but basically, you you'd had a lot of guerrilla <laughs> skirmishes going on, and um, basically there there was a lot of chaos and the area being unsettled, you know, unstable. And so uh, Colonel McNeil came in, um, and um, he had uh, he was de- he was skirmishing with these Confederate guerrillas. Um, at some point in September of sixty two, um, a fella in the area, Andrew Alsman, he was a carpenter and a union man. Uh, he was taken and, for and, an elderly. He yeah, was he was, quite he was sixty. Yeah, he was sixty. But by the same token, he had led. He had actually led. Union uh, forces uh, arresting local Confederates. So he had been actively involved. And so this just wasn't a farmer who'd been sitting on his porch and, and got uh, <laughs> waylaid. Um, so he was taken prisoner by, by uh, Confederates um, and, um, and actually by actually uh, a regular Confederate, Colonel Porter, um, because they raided Palmyra. Uh, as well during this time period and so um, the uh, the union uh, commander uh, basically says let him go or we're you know we'll execute some of uh, your prisoners of war in retaliation yeah. and then on and here's where it gets a little uh bad because um mcneil who was the union uh commander he ends up being labeled the butcher of palmyra in the end but um the provost marshal of the area uh william straken who is a former u.s uh deputy marshal um he he was ordered to basically try to inform the confederate leader of this, giving you know Osman back or else. So he puts a a ad in the paper <laughs> in the in the local union paper at that. And so uh, they no one really thinks that Porter had ever seen the ad and and 
and realistically, they think that Holzman was already dead, potentially. Um, and so nothing happens. And so they take five prisoners from the jail at Palmyra and five from the jail at uh, Ham uh, Hannibal and execute them. Mm -hmm. um, and none of them had anything to do with taking Osman hostage. Yes. So, um, so that was sort of the um, sort of the bad thing there. Um, then it gets even worse with Strake and the, the provost marshal. Um, there's accusations that one of the prisoners that initially was selected, he let go because um, uh, his uh, wife paid uh, Strake in $500. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it goes further that the allegations are that he then raped the man's wife. <laughs> Uh, and he was he was put on trial a couple of years later, still during the war, 1864, for the rape, as well as um, other offenses, including misuse of funds and embezzlement. Um, mm. And he, he was not found guilty on the rape charge, uh, but found guilty on other charges and, and sent to prison. So um, I'm sure that did not help McNeil's reputation as the butcher of Palmyra. I suspect um, not. <laughs> probably not. Um, and then um, there, there was contentions that uh, Osmond had, had actually been alive for a while. Um, some people said that they had seen him alive as late as September 16th in the company of um, Confederate guerrillas near Troublesome Creek, um, ironically named. Um, yeah. And then later in the 1870s, a farmer walking the creek found a skull, who he believed was Allsman's, and eventually uh, ended up at a pharmacist uh, who displayed it, put it on display. Then someone purchased it in the 1890s, I think, and eventually gave it back to one of Allsman's daughters, who's who they say identified, I'm not sure how she positively identified a skull, but um, so you, you know, you have, you have the poor man's skull uh, <laughs> being handed around. So, um, but that's certainly not the only uh, situation where, <laughs> where we have itinerant skulls <laughs> coming into play in the Civil War in Missouri, but uh, oh. certainly, um, an odd situation um and it also it, huh it is odd it is very odd but then it does bring to mind uh the burning of sherwood um which basically was eight months later and in, in um well no i guess it's i guess it'd be 10 months um in the summer of um 1863 in jasper county where mm -hmm. very kind of similar circumstances, uh, but flipped the uh, the Confederates or uh, massacre uh, Union troops at uh, the Raider Farm, and uh, most of the troops at the Union troops actually are black troops out of Kansas, yes. um, and about thirteen uh, Union soldiers are killed. Um, and but but again we we have a civilian uh, tied up in this uh, like Alsman and that's John Bishop but and while while um, all of this is going along Bishop had previously fought with the um, Confederate Partisan Rangers but and had been taken prisoner uh, by the Union at Fort Scott Kansas had been released and was walking home and. In the course of the fighting, he gets recognized by Union soldiers, gets captured, and when their commanding officer gets there in the morning and sees his troops killed, orders Bishop to be shot um, and thrown in, throws his body in with his his own troops' bodies, and then sets them on fire. Yes. Um, and then you then you go back then in a similar fashion you have a um, a standoff between the Union leader and the Confederate leader as to prisoners 
um, and uh, in in this regard, then uh, one of the Union um, prisoners uh, is killed, ironically, um, by someone in the camp. They don't. You know, it's not clear that any of the Confederates actually killed him, but they that perhaps another civilian. And uh, then the Union ends up executing um, uh, soldiers at uh, Fort Scott in retaliation. Yeah. And so. I, I think that there's, there's so many layers of dark history in terms of unpacking mm -hmm. this. The eerie similarities between these two events, to me, speak not of coincidence, but the fact that this was happening a lot. Yes. Now, now the one the one difference is where at Palmyra they put it in the paper, and no one knows whether or not Porter ever saw it. Um, in this situation, the two commanders exchanged letters back and forth, uh, um, uh, basically uh, calling each other out till fine. And but then event, but then ultimately the Confederate commander um, doesn't respond, and 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 the Union commander doesn't know why, but it's because he's actually actually gone to Oklahoma at this point. And mm. so they've actually left the area when the Confederate prisoners of war are executed. Mm. Do you think that, because obviously this is not, these, these are, these events are, are not going according to <laughs> the the Roberts rules of warfare um well kind of yes and kind of no um mm -hmm. it, they aren't but on the other hand uh at least by the point of it I, it had not occurred at the time of Palmyra but between the two events um Jefferson Davis threw down a gauntlet and yes. had said that uh black union soldiers would not be uh, uh, considered prisoners of war. Yes. And so uh, Lincoln had responded that if you don't honor our soldiers as prisoners of war, um, we will respond in like kind. So if you, if you kill our soldiers, be it prepared that we will do the same, an eye for an eye. Um, so by the time you get to Sherwood, that is the policy in place. Mm -hmm. and, but it does seem to be a knee-jerk reaction um, on the part of the commander. Um, and it was very odd that he burned the bodies of his own men. That um, was, you know, it, it is a standout moment in terms mm -hmm. of the historical record. The, the other thing that it, it makes me contemplate, of course, many... Um, Many who were fighting in during in on both sides of the war had seen combat in the Mexican American War um, mm -hmm. prior, but I, I also wonder, in, in terms of some of the decisions that seem uh, that that some of these men perhaps had not a lot of command experience or a lot of combat experience. That they, That's true they, for a lot of them. Now, and actually, this this officer was a career soldier, and so uh, it is a little more um, odd. But he he really did take uh, his command of black troops very seriously, um, because and actually, his troops were the first black soldiers to see combat, not the yeah. uh, Massachusetts Fifty Fourth. Hate to tell you, Corey, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um and so you know he had he had a lot of personal pride wrapped up into that and i think it did uh come out in that and he had kind of taunted this situation by sending in forging wagon trains to draw out the confederates and then yes. when, when they when they responded it did not go well um and not only did he burn the bodies of his of his men and the civilian that was executed but ordered everything within a five mile radius be burned. And that's how the town of Sherwood got burned. Yes, and where, on a, I'm, I'm 
pretty close to knowing where Sherwood was. Where, where was Sherwood in relationship to Peace Cemetery? Peace Church is basically just due south about between a half and three quarters of a mile from where the Raider farm was. Um, yeah. And then Sherwood was just slightly to the Northwest. Yeah, yeah, it's to me. And again, I think something that is increasingly interesting to me, and this I think is, you know, we, we've recently been talking about the, uh, the Noor history of, uh, of Web City. Uh, we had our, our, our event at the, the beautiful uh, ball house, or which really is a mansion, um, uh, available on Airbnb yes. and also for paranormal booking, both. And uh, yes, it is haunted. But the, the, the thing that I just have really been, you know, sort of rolling around in my mind is, again, that extreme stratification in less than two decades between the the culture of the region prior to the war mm -hmm. to then the the almost non-existent culture the devastation that took place after the war and then what is now you know a, a historical victorian period of industrialization and these incredible incredibly beautiful victorian mansions and and uh you know flourishing industry with with the mines uh with a great deal of commerce the the coming of of uh, a number of of railroads mm -hmm. right over the top it's just the 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 extreme juxtaposition is is really even just sort of in you know so many years past and i just to a degree just visualizing it but we're in in other times and places this could be the kind of monumental changes that you would have to either wait a couple hundred years or go to completely different countries and it happened basically less than 20 years right on top of it in the same counties yeah that's very true that's i mean that that I hadn't really thought about that, but that's that's very very true, and 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 the same people, you know, living through all of that. So yeah, it, and it definitely affected people. So, you know, it's um, uh, it is pretty amazing. Now, when, yes. when you said desolation, and everything made me think. Perhaps the the next thing that we ought to throw in here, as far as you know, problematic, is the Irish wilderness. Yes, which is still hard to get to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, but I what I find interesting about the Irish wilderness story in, in this context is we still don't know who the bad actor was. Um, we don't. You know, and, and for background, because we get this question a lot of basically, you know, what is the... Irish wilderness, you know, was there really a town, but, you know, uh, that it's almost becoming urban legend, um, like people don't, aren't realizing what happened, but this was a, um, a settlement of basically Irish Catholics coming out of St. Louis um, into Southern Missouri in, eight, in the late 1850s, 1858, I think and settled in basically um, Eastern Oregon County, uh, Western Ripley County. There was a settlement. Um, they seemed to be doing very well. Um, it, was, it was set up by uh, John Hogan, who was a priest from um, St. Louis and eventually was um, over the arch, diocese of Kansas City, I think. Um, and so he would come down and help resupply the settlement as they were getting started, that kind of thing. Then when the war broke out, he couldn't get down there anymore, uh, couldn't travel, uh, it was too dangerous. And so basically it's kind of like the Roanoke story, you know? It is. <laughs> you know, it really where, is. you know, 
Governor White or whatever his name was goes bad for supplies in England, comes back in three years and everyone's gone. Well, that's pretty much what happened. You know, he, there were, there was, a, I think he was able to go down 1862 was the last time he was able to go down. And um, so, and then he couldn't go again until the war was over. And when he got there, everything was gone and, and it was kind of like growing up. Everything, it was like the ground was wiped clean. There wasn't even ruins of the, of the settlement. Um, and so there's various theories, but what seems to make the most sense is that the settlement was wiped out by one side or the other in the war yes. that what, you know, soldiers from one side or the other, uh, wiped them out. And we simply don't know. And it could have been either side. Um, it, it really, it really could have been. You know, and it, it's the, the the approximate location of the of the settlement was on uh, an important north south route, right? That that, that uh, you know, uh, militias, uh, bushwhackers, uh, or uh, standing standing army uh, mm -hmm. would have potentially been traversing. Well, and and to be you know very practical, and I'm, I'm not casting stones in his direction but this is exactly where colonel leaper was operating yes it is which does bring up some just some interesting conjecture it does so do you do you want do you want to touch on oh you know, <laughs> well <laughs> i'm i'm looking forward to uh, to hopefully getting back over um uh, over in the wayne county area and it, to me, it's an incredibly fascinating uh, space. It, it's also it's also a space that I, I find particularly interesting. There's a lot of longstanding, uh, you know, uh, Catholic parishes, uh, Catholic mm -hmm. churches in the area, which to me speak interestingly. Obviously, those churches were um, were, were established, you know, later. Right. Um, but to me, it 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 speaks to something that is you know, a comparative proximity to St. Louis, mm -hmm. and, and as well as just hearkening to the, uh, to the Irish settlement, which was, uh, you know, the, the project of an Irish Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, jumping, jumping just back to the, the, the Irish wilderness itself for a moment, the lost colony, so to speak, that is something that is, to me, very evocative, very haunting, and very, very, Mm, just very melancholy is that these were um, Irish families who had successfully escaped the famine. They had escaped the famine in Ireland. They, get, they came over here. There was not a lot of opportunity for them in St. Louis in the 1850s, a lot of poverty. And so this was their chance to establish themselves. And, and from by all accounts, they had done well. And, and um, uh, and have prospered, and so that there are various theories that you know, uh, killing them for their money was one of the motives. Um, whoever yes. did, but and it could have just been, you know, basically being in the way too. But right. uh, Colonel Leeper uh, was operating right in that area. I mean, he there was, you know, he attacked Donovan, and which yes. is just miles away, the seat and of Ripley County. And and to me, Leaper is Leaper is a fascinating, certainly a fascinating character. I, I think it is fair in the the time that has elapsed to mm -hmm. consider Leaper to be a fascinating villain. I think it's mm -hmm. I think that's reasonable. This was a an individual who's certainly profit driven, uh, much like Jim Lane. Uh, but also an, an individual who seemed to to take uh, an enormous amount of uh, of personal gratification in hunting down, in some cases, entire families. Yeah, well, and it, and in that respect, you know, the, I think he diverges a little bit from Lane, which I think Lane was more just money driven, but. In, in that regard, he reminds me more of Quantrell because Quantrell 
he he didn't give up he he didn't give up a bone he you know he he ended up having a feud with someone he didn't let it go and and Leaper was much the same they just were on opposite sides I think that's I think that's an interesting really an interesting point of comparison and something that is I, there's there's some just sort of piecing things together in terms of of Leaper's life and perhaps reading a little bit between the lines. So some of this is is conjecture, um, but it, it appears that Leaper was a very um, spiritually minded man in in very unique ways. Um, he he began his his early life in Kentucky. He was a preacher. Mm -hmm. uh, and he seems to have conflated um, potential slights of the community and the, the chaos of the war with, uh, it might, I'm conjecturing here a little bit, uh, but it seems that his... Mm, his 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 inability to let a grudge go uh, appear to have religious the the overtones of religious fervor that's interesting i hadn't really thought about that whereas like with Quantrell, it wasn't so much that it for him it seemed to always come down to his sense of honor um, agreed and retribution but not in a religious sense and uh, it it almost almost seems to go as far that that the leaper felt that if if a slight was made against him it was potentially like a slight was being made against his god as well oh well you know a lot of the, you know a lot of these figures had, they had rather large egos so <laughs> they did um what i found you know it's just as a as a, as a point of comparison there's a very chilling story associated with the leaper mansion which still stands mm -hmm private property um and of course there's there is a lead leaper is is uh, uh is buried on the property mm -hmm. and his ghost is said to haunt uh the location but uh before his death he he went mad uh mm -hmm. ultimately had to be constrained by by being tied to his bed uh to prevent yeah. himself from harming himself further or potentially harming others and based on the uh, you know the observations of his his ravings, was that he was seeing hell and that the the demons were coming to get him, or perhaps the ghosts of the people he had killed. Yes, <laughs> and which is is quite possible considering the uh, the uh, the vendettas that he had he had created. But it, to me, it's just such a such there's sort of four parts to Leaper's story, which left an indelible mark on the region. Uh, the, the, this particular uh, chunk of the Ozarks, which is extraordinarily beautiful, essentially due west of Cape Girardeau. And- Well, and, and I guess we should say too, we're not sliding Arkansas here because Leaper operated in Arkansas as well. He did. And, you know, there, there's, there's a, uh, uh, a point not very far. This is jumping subjects, but it's a it's a cross state lines. I'm mean, including Missouri and Arkansas, um, and a, it's a little bit of a track that I, I look forward to making one of these days. But uh, very near Leaper, very near this is Gads Hill, which is uh, mm -hmm. is where um, the James Gang um, took, I believe, their first train. It's supposed to be their first train robbery. Or at least known for sure to be their first, and and just you know shortly before, weeks before, I think even uh, uh, it, I don't remember the the exact time, but it it was an amount of time that really surprised me because their their previous action was holding up stage near Malvern, Arkansas, mm -hmm. and that is the the distance between Gads Hill and the outskirts of Malvern, Arkansas, even today that's a hike yeah 
and well, uh, but, I mean, actually, if if you look at, at what they traversed at different times, I mean, they they would hide out in Texas, out in Virginia at times, out way out west. the The amount of time they spent in a saddle is amazing. It is. It is, and it it's well. That's a whole other story. But I I love the 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 mystique of the. I, it's not an exclusively American motif, but it certainly is an American motif of uh, uh, the outsider on, uh, you know, with a horse and a gun or the oh, outsider yeah. with the, um, the, the great American muscle car and the gun. Yep. But the, uh, you know, Leaper really left an, an indelible mark on the region. And then I, I really see that, you know, his, his life being roughly characterized in, in four sections. The, uh, the young Kentucky preacher with a, a zeal for religion, a um, man responding to war by essentially um, hunting families uh, with the intent to murder them yeah. and and then recasting himself uh, after the war as a union industrialist who mm-hmm. largely remade the region at that time for the better and yeah. was heralded um, as, as I think a number of individuals in the space were, I'm, I'm assuming they weren't all nearly as psychopathic as, as uh, Leaper was, but uh, taking advantage of the post-war industrialism and, uh, you know, and also tying this in not only with industry and rail, but also with government because he became a representative. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then the, the final chapter uh, of going mad. I mean, that, that, I mean, that's certainly a, you know, when you think about a character that um, one is very problematic and, and two just illustrates all of these, all these potential issues. <laughs> really does. Um, every, all the things that could possibly go wrong uh, in, in one person. It's, in uh, one person. Um, and, 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 you know, to some degree, um, even being remembered to a degree within certain factions, being remembered well because of the prosperity that his industrialism brought. Well, yeah, and, and that's one of the things. It's not one dimensional because, you know, uh, he did horrible things, but on the other hand, he helped the region too later on. So, uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it's not one dimensional. Um, <laughs> This kind of brings us to uh, some of our favorite stories, a villa and, and uh, Dead Man's Pawn. Oh, yes. Oh, the Yoakum Pond. Mm-hmm. Oh, and uh, Rotten Johnny Reb. Yep. Although we don't know that he was a Confederate. Uh, well, no, but likely because um, uh, at a villa, because he... Uh, Avila was targeted by uh, Confederate uh, guerrillas uh, routinely because it, was, because it was a union struggle. So um, chances are he was. Yes. And uh, there's, there's with Avila, and Avila is one of, I, I love Avila. I, 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 I really do. Um, and just landing, I'm, I'm, I don't have my notes in front of me, but I don't really... I don't really need him for this. There's a bunch of different things that I find really, really fascinating uh, about the Avila story. I'm gonna start here um, at, at point A, which is that if you currently look up Avila, it did get relegated into bait. Um, you, can, you can find Avila as the, uh, the, 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 Land of Shadow Men, yeah. and a and a you know it's listed as a and a, and I think erroneous, obviously erroneously, because a villa still has plenty of people living in it. Uh, it's not a ghost town, but it did get listed as such as this place that if you're looking for cheap thrills and you want to you know find um, Shadow Men who are there, uh, 
then you know um hide your way across uh i-44 and take the villa exit and before you know it you know you'll be on a scooby adventure yeah. <laughs> but don't do that right now because in between in between the exit and a villa a bridge is being worked on so yeah. uh, yes yes it is you have to go and, along. um but uh very true so go ahead <laughs> <laughs> and something that i i find sometimes it's very entertaining to me sometimes it is frustrating to me is that these locations like based like the the work that we do and being embedded is that we find uh all sorts of haunted locations oh yeah and, and most of them comparatively speaking do not have any notoriety attached to them true and and then and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing no it's not and then every once in a while a location will will just get like picked out and become clickbait uh it's like slender man it's like shadow man in a villa um sometimes it's like the chupacabra um you know it is it, perennially it is the ozark howler and they just don't stop and it's like yeah that's nice but there there is so much more uh, mm -hmm. to all of this that that uh is is more nuanced and to me more interesting than essentially you know the top the top 10 haunted locations clickbait that yeah, i and, find and, it and, and and yeah it gets listed on those lists so it does and i find it i find that a little wearying uh that said a villa is is a beautiful small very small town at this mm -hmm. point on old route 66 with it with an extraordinary history as you noted it was a union stronghold during the war and i i'm i don't know how i feel about this because i i generally have a very positive uh although it's a bit eerie opinion of the 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 townspeople's opinions mm -hmm. uh, because we just got done talking about uh leaper who yeah. essentially organized hunting party uh organized men to go hunt men um and, and there is something uniquely different about you know uniquely different from say two standing armies that engage Mm -hmm. as opposed to uh a handful of townspeople or a town a handful of men uh who say we're going to go hunt other human beings yes and and that did happen at a villa but it's funny it has a very different uh contextual feel than leaper um yes and in part that they decided to do that in in a in a defensive posture they it wasn't that where Leaper just decided I'm going to go do this. Um, yeah. They were attacked almost on a daily basis by guerrilla fighters. And so um, early in the war, most places that experienced this kind of took the we circle the wagons mentality and, you know, we, we hole up and we shoot at them as they run in and ride out and hopefully we get some of them and a villa and of course you're familiar with the terrain it is in a very sort of flat area open area um that doesn't lend itself well to defense right <laughs> so uh you know the townsmen finally decided we're getting tired of this so they went out on patrol on a nightly basis to try to discourage the guerrillas from attacking them because you know houses have been burned people murdered the founder of the town had already been murdered um and um so in, in actuality over time uh what a villa did became the model for hometown uh guards throughout missouri it was adopted throughout the state eventually as a way of dealing with these issues but 
they would ride out and if they came if they encountered gorillas then they would skirmish with them um and they very much took the position of uh you know bushwhacker beware don't come to our town you know um, yes. um and um then of course uh rotten johnny reb story comes out of the fact that at one point they find a body that they had known they had, had killed someone and the body's decomposing and and they you know look it over and someone kicks it or whatever and the and the head goes rolling and <laughs> and so they take the head and hang it from a tree uh, at the edge of town at, at, you know as a warning you know this is what you have what happens uh which is no different than what happened on you know london bridge for hundreds of years <laughs> it's very very true i again the, the the motif of the severed head has cultural ramifications that go back in multiple cultures and multiple traditions uh, millennia in, in this case, I think it was more pragmatic than anything else. Yeah. The, the, the story seems to associate that the, the, the skull, initially the, the head, then the skull, mm -hmm. was, uh, was placed either in an in a, in a Osage hedge tree or an apple tree. Right. I've heard both, but um, uh, that it was an orchard. Um, and so some people would say an apple orchard, but that doesn't make any sense because the only orchard in the area would not have been along the road. Um, mm -hmm. And so my guess it it was um, Osage orange tree. Yeah. Um, or uh, you know, for for other locals, a hedge apple tree. A hedge apple tree, which could easily explain the 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 use of the word apple. That's true that that is true over time um and so um and but that seems to make more sense to me because you mm -hmm. know that they were, you know hedge trees everywhere and uh, you know just hanging up nets to, nets to the road you know yes um hedge trees for the record are are very evocative i, I just the, the overall shape is is rather extraordinary they're, i they're, they're very uh gothic and and kind of creepy they can be um i, I love food. them huh i love i love hedge trees i i do too of course they make great fence posts and the if you throw the apples under your house you won't have mice so. yes and uh um the uh the the hedge tree was uh oh um surprised as uh Mm. as uh, as bow wood uh, by the osage and and it's they're also referred to as a bow dart tree yes mm -hmm. and uh having <clears throat> my uh, the producer on my side keeps moving my camera um but uh, you're getting you're getting wonky get down um <laughs> oh. <laughs> he stepped in his food cart um he probably needs to um, go find a trunk of floor to uh, utilize, which is what he's been doing for the past two days. Um, or go bark at his reflection of the refrigerator, which is what he was doing earlier. But um, for people who uh, might be wondering what tree that we're, we're talking about, um, if you want to look it up, it's Maclura pomifera. Um, and uh, it's actually related to the mulberry. It's in the mulberry family. But, I did not know that. Mm -hmm. um, but I have uh, huge uh, spiky uh, thorns, yes. and uh, the squirrels love the uh, the hedge apples, and uh, and the and the wood is mm, almost permanent. It does bring up, you know, sadly, I'm assuming that at some point these modernity cut down the hedge trees, but if the, it had not or it did not. Uh, it's quite reasonable that the trees would still be alive. That's true. They they're very long lived. And um, another thing, you know, I've, I've heard people locally just refer to them as thorn trees too, um, yeah. because yeah, because they do have 
very vicious thorns, but um, they do. I've, I've gotten a few in my foot on occasion. Ow. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> well, yeah. um, I've, I've, been, I've had them caught in my clothes and stuck in my arm before, but not stepped on. But it, it can, it's, it's a bit uncomfortable. I can tell you that. I, I would, I would imagine. Yeah, because they, they are sizable thorns. Yes, yes, they are. And, and, but again, it's, to me, it's the, you know, the Osage is a, is an all American tree. Uh, a lot of our, a lot of uh, tree species that we have obviously are brought, you know, were imported. Um, or they have close analogs, um, you know, like for example, maple, maples and oak may have a, a fairly similar analog in Europe, et cetera. Right. Uh, the, um, the Osage orange or the hedge tree stands rather uh, alone in terms of its, you know, its unique stature. Uh, sure. And also its, its stature, its, its uh, significance in uh, its impact on the culture because it was, it was very, it was deeply, um, you know, regarded uh, by the, by, by Native American peoples for the obvious use as to make bows, uh, but then it became equally well regarded uh, by the settlers as as hedge po as fence posts. Yes, I mean it, you can still find it, fence posts from eighteen hundreds. Yes, yeah, hundred hundred year old, hundred fifty year old fence posts. And they're just standing there. They don't rot. They can't rot. Mm -mm. Um, <laughs> and and. Um, and I, ironically, during the the 1930s, uh, part of the uh, civilian corps and the the um, I think the the freshly minted um, Department of Agriculture decided that uh, you know the, the rural America across the Midwest would be framed by by neat English style hedges made entirely of uh, Osage orange and multiflora rose. Well, I don't think they intend. Well, they 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 did in, they did introduce whole floor rows, but they quickly yes, they changed their mind on that. And yeah, you <laughs> ever tried to kill one? <laughs> we, we, I'm sure that there's a there's a lot of uh, of um, southern and midwestern farmers that if they could find the guys who did that, they they'd be happy to toss them into a into a either a, a multi floor rosebush uh or into a valley full of kudzu yes and well and and you can you could ask now it's i was cut i was cussing cussing the cussing them the other day so <laughs> <laughs> now this brings us to yokum's pond or as it's also known dead man's as, pond as dead man's pond i it's it is an incredibly evocative of course local story from stone county and uh, sort of the the Avila story, but more on the run. Uh, it it is it, except for where Avila they went out patrolling. Um, this was just a matter of finally a townsman saying we've had enough, um, and it was not a grill of uh, fighters. It, it it really was just bushwhackers uh, committing crimes in the vacuum of law enforcement. Yes. Um, coming up from Arkansas to wrestle uh, cattle and horses. Um, yes, which they did. They did. And by most accounts, if I recall right, had stolen about 120 head of, of cattle and some horses um, in the in the Galena area. And they had, um, there was a shootout uh, at town um, with townsmen. And they rode south. Um, and we're not expecting to be followed because they hadn't been before. Um, right. And so they end up camping at the pond. Um, and some of the townsmen said, we've had enough. And so they ride out during the night and catch them and catch them while they're asleep and ambush them. Yes. Um, successfully ambush them yes. and kill them. Yeah, uh, I, if I recall right, like all of them were killed. If I recall right, I, I believe so. And you know, and it, it does. I think it really does speak into that, 
you know, the fact that the, the, the breakdown of law and order and the fact that the, uh, the folks at Galena just said, okay, we're done. We're done. We got to do something. Um, and, and, and this was also following the fact that the, the bushwhackers had killed several, several people in town. Yeah, in the shootout, sure. they killed several people, and it wasn't the first time they had been through taking stuff either. So, um, no, it, it was you know that final straw. Um, but I, you know, part of the the legend around it that I always like, of course, there's legends that the the pond that in that area is haunted from that. Um, yes, and there there are stories of over the years of uh, owners um, basically dredging up skulls and human bones out of the out of the pond um, yeah and so and if i recall right there was a time uh quite a few years after the civil war that basically no one would go around it, mm -hmm. um, and, it and that uh it brings up a, just an interesting concept i want to throw this out here just in terms of paranormal the idea that say a, a location where an atrocity has occurred mm -hmm. has some sort of special energy, um, dark energy, malevolence. The idea that people avoid it is yeah. is, is something that that you see popping up frequently in in history. You know, in terms of how how society or how a local population has responded to uh, to severe violence. Yeah, well, in fact, the Raider Farm massacre is a good example because they, after the farmhouse was burned, um, Mrs. Raider and her children went to Texas. Um, yeah. Her husband and oldest son were serving as officers in the Confederate Army, and um, Mr. Raider was killed in the Army or in the war. And so they didn't come back. And it sat in the land sat empty for uh, 40 years mm -hmm. uh, and then someone bought it and they built and no one would go around the area where the the house had been and the the owners uh in the um around the turn of the century um built a house and actually built it right where the original farmhouse was and the story goes you know locals you know, people told him don't do that it's haunted you know you're it's cursed etc and you know they're like poo that's that's superstitious etc and then the story goes that they built the house and they lived there for um, a few years and it burned down with no explanation wow. how it burned and wow. then after that no one ever rebuilt on it yeah yeah and it's i don't know it Obviously, the, there's there's some of these locations that I'm sure that you could go and, you know, ultimately be able to to collect data on on activity, and at the same time, there's some locations that I'm sure that you wouldn't necessarily pick anything up on, but I think regardless as a as a societal situation, there's. As a societal situation, there, there's two, two modes of thought. And one of them says that the past doesn't matter. We're going to do whatever the heck we want to. Right. And, and the other says that the past does matter. And in some way, perhaps shaped by a, a particular folkloric belief and perhaps not, um, we, we have to honor and respect the past. That and sometimes maybe even the past itself somehow influences what happens directly. Yes, and I think I think that third is is in some cases definitely a reality. Well, I well I do too. In in some places, it's hard to explain otherwise. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes there are layers. It is very fascinating. It is. That that may be that may be a good spot for us to uh, end. That that works. I think we've. This has been a fun topic. It really has. Enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course, we do encourage everyone to uh, 
uh, like, share, follow, subscribe, all of those things. And uh, let's uh, start this soon on a regular basis, but let's uh, just invite people to subscribe. We have a new feature here on yes. Dark Those Arts on Facebook. Yes, um, there, there is a, an associated group uh, on the page. It, you, you, it has information about subscribing. It's for a private group with exclusive content. Um, and it, th there is a subscription fee, small one, but it helps um, support further research and our efforts here. So um, the, the, more, the, more, the more that, that, that it's supported, the more we can do. Yes, and, uh, and, and we are excited. We have already begun creating exclusive content. Yes. And basically it works like Patreon, so, but it's through mm -hmm. Facebook. Yes, and so and Facebook's doing a uh, a thing where it's free trial that you can you can do, and I think it sits two months free. So, oh, very uh, cool. You can select that, and so and you can cancel anytime. So, absolutely, we uh, we look forward to doing that. And of course, it's a it is a great way to to support content like Dark the Ozarks, and yes. uh, we appreciate everyone who has already joined. Yes, we do. And, um, and it's a way for you to have a private space to chat with us or share your ideas or thoughts too. Yes, yes. And uh, I'm really a much more uh, direct or personal level. Me too. I like it. <laughs> I do. Uh, we thank everybody and uh, we'll, be, we'll be back here uh, next Wednesday night on Dark Ozarks. Yes, we will. Hope everyone has a good week. Night, everybody. Night, all.